Amos chapter 5, we continue in the messages really of Amos, the sermons of Amos, and we'll begin at verse 18. Amos chapter 5 and verse 18, this is the word of God. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear. As though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall only to have a snake bite him. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light, pitch dark without a ray of brightness? I hate, I despise your religious feasts. I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-ending stream. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings 40 years in the desert, O house of Israel? You have lifted up the shrine of your king, the pedestal of your idols, the star of your God, which you made for yourselves. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is God Almighty. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Have you ever heard the expression that so-and-so is in left field? You ever heard that? It, it means that someone really doesn't have a clue to the way things really are. I thought of that when I approached this passage because it's as though God, through the prophet Amos, is saying to the northern kingdom of Israel, you all are in left field. You are clueless about the way things really are. There are a lot of people in left field today when it comes to the church. And remember, Amos was preaching to the covenant people of God. He wasn't preaching to the pagan unbelievers. He was preaching to church people. In thinking about that, I think about the last quarter century in the conservative church. We won't even talk about the other branches of the church, but those who claim to believe the scripture, those who would say the Bible is the word of God, we're supposed to understand it and live by it. Those people, one of the great debates the last quarter century among conservative theologians is on the existence of hell. For the past several years, one of the great debates that has raged is on the openness of God, meaning that God changes his mind because he looks and sees circumstances. And I just have to tell you that historically, our Reformed and Presbyterian forefathers would be spinning in their graves to hear that such a topic was even being discussed because it strikes at the heart of the sovereignty and self-sufficiency of God. For if God is dependent upon circumstances, then God help us. Lots of people in left field when you talk about the deity of Christ, when you talk about salvation by grace through faith alone, when you talk about the day of judgment, many people who call themselves Christians would walk away from what the church has taught traditionally and what the Bible has taught. And I would submit to you that the Bible would say that those folks are in left field. So 
out of touch were the Israelites in the northern kingdom that they actually, on hearing the sermons of Amos, and those of you who've been with us know they're not easy. They said, only the Lord would lead you to preach a series like this because it's no fun for the preacher, but it's so necessary for the preacher as well as the people in the pew. You see, Amos came preaching and you've been with us and you've heard the words that God has said through him to his people. And so far in left field were they that the people were saying, preach it, Amos, tell God, bring it on, bring the day of the Lord. And you come to this passage and basically God through his prophet says, are you people crazy? What in the world are you thinking when you say, bring on the day of the Lord? You see, the day of the Lord for the enemies of God is a day of inescapable destruction and woe. God, through his prophet Amos, has told these people, you've passed the point as a nation, as a people, where I can spare judgment. That judgment will come, and it did. The Assyrians came and did exactly what God said they would do. The day of the Lord came. But that's just a picture of the ultimate day of the Lord that is coming. You see, the fatal mistake of these in the northern kingdom was that they thought they were the people of God pleasing him when in reality they had become the enemies of God. Not the prophet's idea, not my idea, God's reality. And so this morning we want to look at the text as the message is laid out. First of all, in verses 18 through 20, you see the faulty reasoning of the people. Verse 18, 1, woe. You mark in your Bible, circle that word, woe. Woe is an exclamation of utter, utter abhorrence and terror at what is to come because woe signifies that God's judgment has been pronounced. Woe, the prophet says, because God has decreed this day and there's no means of escape. And yet you welcome it. Because you see, they heard what they wanted to hear. They heard that God was going to judge all the wicked people around them. You ever hear sermons that way? Sometimes. I know some children that hear those sermons and say, boy, that's my parents. That's it. There are some parents who listen and all they hear is, that's my child. There are some wives who listen and say, boy, that's my husband. I hope he's listening. And there are some husbands who say, Lord, deliver me. That's my wife. <laughs> you get the point. And then we're all really good at listening saying, yeah, that's that brother sitting on the pew over there. Boy, I hope he's hearing this. <laughs> and somebody in the back saying, that sister up front, boy, I hope she's hearing this. God's speaking to you, woman. I hope you're listening. <laughs> you see, we look at these people and we can get all high and mighty, but sometimes we hear what we want to hear too. You see, the problem is, if we're honest before God, we can't change the channel. We can't exit off this screen. We have to hear what God would say to his people. You see, his people understood that the day of the Lord was a day of judgment upon the enemies of God. The problem was, it never occurred to them that they had become the enemies, even though the prophet had been preaching to them. God had been speaking to them and saying, you have become my enemies. And Amos depicts the certainty of the judgment to come by using two illustrations from rural life. He said it's like going out and being on the path and you meet a lion. And somehow 
you are able to escape the lion. And in that time, there were lions and bears throughout Israel. And you go, whoa, wow, thank you. I sure dodged that bullet. And you turn the next bend, and there's a bear. Inescapable. And said, then you may dodge the bear, and you get home, and you close the door, and put your hand on the door facing, and say, whoa, made it home, only to be struck by a snake inescapable it's coming it's like I told a fellow one time he was in a course with me and he said I don't believe in hell I don't believe in a judgment I said well you won't be there long till you do he said that's a problem with you people you people I said let me ask you something let's just be honest I said, put on your big boy pants and let down your prejudice a minute. I said, if you're right and I'm wrong, we're all going to be okay, right? Yeah. I said, but what if? What if I'm right and the Bible does teach that? What if the church for almost 2,000 years held to this, and only in the last couple hundred years people even seriously began to question that. What if I'm right and you're wrong, what are the consequences? And he said, I don't want to think about it. I said, friend, one day you will think about it, but it'll be too late. Amos was preaching to these people. Judgment for the nation was coming. And in verse 20, the day for Israel held only curse, not blessing, regardless of what their priests told them, regardless of what their king told them, regardless of what their scholars told them. God told them this is true. The second section of Amos' message here addresses their false confidence. You see that in verses 21 through 24. What Israel was so proud of, God hated. These Israelites excelled in their religious liturgy and going through the form, and they were meticulous in doing that. But they were also exceptional when it came to greed and idolatry and depressing the poor. God was saying to his people, oh, you come and you do it upright. You make sure every detail of your liturgy and your ritual is exactly right. And then you walk out and you oppress your neighbor. You literally manipulate the system so you rob from those who are weak. You worship idols because their religion had become very open and syncretistic and they could leave the temple of God and then go to the shrine of an idol and participate with one of the shrine prostitutes all the time saying they were pleasing and serving God. God here completely rejects their worship. The very thing in which these people were trusting, the methodology and the method, was that which God despised and hated when it was not accompanied by the heart. You see, true worship of God is not going through the motions, sterilely going through, but it is worship that comes as the fruit of relationship. So that our heart is in it as best we can be. I'm not going to lie and tell you that some Sundays the Apostles' Creed is as, as exciting as other Sundays. Or that the Lord's Prayer is always scintillating. But it is always good. And keeps our feet grounded in the history and tradition of the church that reflects biblical truth. That reminds us that we stand on the shoulders of generations of believers who have gone before us believing the same truths, 
practicing the same faith, striving to live in their day and time faithfully, wholeheartedly for Jesus Christ. One commentator says this, the prophet did not address secular or indifferent people, but a folk who went about religion with zeal and extravagance. Oh, you would have been impressed with their worship in the northern kingdom. But remember, when Jeroboam instituted that, he set up calf items at the north and southern boundaries. He appointed priests. He removed the priests that had been put in place by God at Sinai, and he put in his own priest who served his own purpose because he said, if I don't, these people will leave me and go back to Jerusalem. And so they were trusting in that which was perverted from the beginning. And God says, what you trust in, I hate. And thirdly, in verses 25 through 27, he points out the foolishness of their faith. They say, look at these offerings we bring. Look at the number of offerings we bring. We bring all these offerings you've required, even fellowship offerings. And God says, let me ask you something. When your forefathers were in the wilderness, did they make all these offerings? And if you go back and study, you find that there were no regular offerings in the wilderness wanderings, occasional offerings, but not regular daily sacrifices. He says it wasn't their offerings. It was their heart. It was their relationship with me that mattered. And if you know anything about those times, you know that was a bumpy relationship. God was faithful to them not because they got the offering right, but because he chose to love them and be faithful and forgive them. And there were many who were faithful. Moses, Joshua, Caleb, about whom the scripture says they followed him whole. Heartedly. <clears throat> Foolish faith, trusting in that which can never save, and giving up the only one who can. You see, these people were not following God wholeheartedly. In fact, the prophet says, You're not following him at all. I cannot imagine how hard it must have been for Amos to go and preach these messages in the heart of the capital of the northern kingdom. As I've told you before, he was from the south. He had an accent. <laughs> Some of us can really relate to that, can't we? to be broken in his heart by God's message for these people. And then hear them say, yes, Lord, bring it on. Because they were so foolish and so blind. You see, they would experience God's terrible judgment. I've described some of those to you before when the Assyrians came. Oh, they would experience the day of the Lord. And they would be amazed. And I'm sure some said, remember that little preacher from the south, Amos, who said this very thing would happen. And we laughed at him. And we said, you're foolish and stupid. And he was right. And we are lost. Let me ask you, are you in left field with respect to your relationship with your creator God? You see, that's a matter between you and God. He alone knows your heart and he will reveal it to you. If you ask him, 
but too many people don't want to know the true condition of their heart. Have you been hearing these sermons with ears for somebody else? Saying, yeah, Lord, if they don't straighten up, they're going to feel the burn. What about you? What about me? Is our worship a reflection of our relationship with God? Not always perfect. Believe me, I don't ever preach a perfect sermon. But God uses imperfect vessels to accomplish his purposes. You see, he's not so concerned we hit all the notes when we're singing. He just wants to know that our hearts are singing because we love him. You see, he doesn't care how much we give because if our hearts are right, he'll know that it's exactly what needs to be given. It's not that you sit perfectly through a sermon and your mind never wander or sometimes your eyelids never fall. Been there, done that. But sit in your heart, you want to hear God's word. You want to follow him and please him. Are you in left field when it comes to God and the truth of his word? Or would you like the faithful? Say, oh Lord, help me to hear better. To obey wholeheartedly. And have mercy on those who need to hear you. Because if they don't, they will experience this judgment and an eternity apart from you. Only in Jesus Christ can we know our creator God. Only in him can we walk this Christian life wholeheartedly and faithfully. Is that what you desire? Then like me, cry out, say, God, help me. I want to do better. And if you don't, oh, friend, cry out to Jesus, save me. Make me a new creation. Give me a heart that loves the living God. Before it's too late for, I don't care what the theologians tell you. I don't care what your friends tell you. God says there's coming a day. And only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Will enter that kingdom. The rest will here depart from me. I don't know you. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Lord says to his church. Amen.